All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Zaki Naveed. I'm an R3 at Einstein Healthcare Network in Philadelphia. Firstly, I would like to thank everyone for tuning into this webinar from the Research and Innovation Committee. I believe this is the first RFS webinar to kick off the year, maybe. Um, I'm going to quickly introduce our speaker, Dr. Mueller, with whom I've had the pleasure of meeting at a conference in which he was the keynote speaker. In fact, um, you know, that's where I pitched him the idea of giving a webinar, so here we are. Um, so Dr. Mueller did his training at MGH and has been loyal to them since. He is professor of radiology at Harvard and has served as director of the Interventional Radiology Division at MGH. He is the past editor-in-chief of seminars in interventional radiology and has served on the editorial boards of many prestigious radiology journals. He received a gold medal from the British Interventional Radiology Society and has had the honor of giving the daughter lecture at the SIR. So today, his talk, which is titled Interventional Radiology, Are We Who We Think We Are? It's going to be somewhat of a philosophical talk on IR. So without further ado, welcome Dr. Mueller. We're all very excited to hear from you. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you, Zucky. Uh, I appreciate the invitation. I hope uh, everybody out there can uh, hear this and uh, enjoy this. Uh, I actually have never done a webinar, so it's kind of exciting for me. I'm not sure if there are five people or five million people. If there are five million people, I think I'm going to start a podcast and see what I can do about that. But uh, I uh, I appreciate anybody who's listening. And, and as uh, Zucky, Zucky said, this is a somewhat of a philosophical talk, but uh, I've been in the IR business for a long time, and I'll give you some anecdotes about that as the talk goes on. Uh, I actually still work uh, this morning. I'll give you a little summary of my day so you guys know what I do. I got up about quarter or four in the morning and went on my treadmill uh, to sort of get psyched up for the day. I'm a little crazy like that, I guess. Then I meet the... Uh, IR fellows in the, the Mass General, we meet at 6.15 in the morning and we go see patients that were done the night before. And we try to discuss, you know, hopefully it's some teaching stuff. I mean, they all get coffee with me afterwards, so maybe that's why they come. But uh, we had the kind of patients we saw, we saw uh, a post overdose coagulation uh, or anti-coagulation bleeder that we had, uh, we had done, we saw uh, a biliary drainage which had failed in the RCP. We saw a diverticulitis abscess. We can't get through maybe f more than four to eight patients. Today we only saw four. And the last one was a post-transplant bioloma patient. But there's a variety of patients we see and we try to talk about. So the rest of the day I did, uh, I don't do all the cases I used to, but we have a whole bevy of cases and, and, and things we do. And uh, I'll tell you the main thing about my day is, and I started this like a long time ago, is I had a lot of fun. But this is going to be a little bit of a philosophical talk. Uh, you know, I started doing intervention in 1977 and I sort of had my own opinion on it. And hopefully I can and without proselytizing too much, hopefully uh, I can convince you of what I think IR is, what it can be, and what people like you in the audience who are young and enthusiastic can make it in the future. So, you know, I'm a little leery about philosophy talks. Uh, this is uh, adapted from Woody Allen, who used to be a good comedian. You don't hear from much anymore, but those who can't do teach. And you saw I got up early in the morning to teach. Those who can't teach give philosophy talks. So hopefully, uh, you know, you'll get something out of it, as I said. Uh, as uh, Zucky said, this was a, uh, a named lecture that I gave uh, a couple months ago in September to fellows and uh, med students and some staff. And uh, there were a lot of uh, other people who had given this talk. And I, I like this quote, which is an old quote from uh, the old Pittsburgh Pirates manager, one of his players. You know, can I leave up, live up to all the speakers that you guys hear? Guys, by the way, is generic and men and women. Uh, I knew we would have a tough season when we lined up for the national anthem. And one of my players said, every time I hear that song, I have a bad game. So hopefully this won't be a bad game for you. But uh, the talk is entitled interventional radiology are we who we think we are and sometimes i think we lose sight of that when we're just hanging around you know you're hanging around your own group and you're going to the sir 
well, how are we viewed out there? What can we do? What's the competition? What have we done? What do we need to do to make this especially continue to be great and innovative? And that's what this talk is a little bit about. And I am going to try to give you the truth, as this ex-football Lions, Detroit Lions coach said in relating to the players recently, the key, what is sincerity and truth? The key to this whole business is sincerity. Once you learn to fake that, you've got it made. So hopefully you'll consider this a sincere talk. So back to the original question uh, team out there. Are we who we think we are? We think we're pretty hotshot interventionists and doctors and we go to the meetings and this kind of stuff, but what's the perception out there? So let's go a little bit backwards in time. And uh, I'm gonna give you two, uh, this, oh, this movie, which is fa fairly famous uh, about Charles' daughter, who I'm sure you've all heard of, or you've heard your mentors talk about, or you've talked about the daughter, you heard about the daughter lecture, the daughter procedures, quite an amazing guy. And I'm just going to play this through. It's a little long, but I think it's interesting historically to listen to. So an amazing guy. I hope you can hear me. Z Zucky uh, said I should turn up my volume, so hopefully that helped. So as this demonstrated way back, this amazing guy, and I think you can appreciate the humbleness uh, of him that comes through. And I think when you listen to great interventionalists, great leaders, that's one of the primary things that comes out with these people, great innovators. And he certainly had that. And he wasn't the only one. There was another person a little less famous who also had what I call the franchise, the control of some of these interventional procedures. He was uh, uh, from Vienna and went to, was in private practice in radiology in the West Coast, ended up uh, actually uh, eventually at the uh, University of uh, British Columbia in Vancouver, Joachim Berheny, and another amazing dynamic guy who, uh, maybe this is pertinent with this, uh, with what's going on in the news, he actually took care of the uh, Shah uh, of, of Iran, uh, who had a uh, gallstone or gallbladder surgery and was left with common duck, common duck stones. And he actually, this is well prior to the uh, ERCP era, era but he uh, developed this procedure 
post-operatively through a T-tube to remove gallstones. It was a great procedure. It was incredibly fun. It was like fishing. You knew you got the stone out, outpatient procedure. Front page of the New York Times disappeared in. So we have two incredible leaders who, you know, early on were setting the, the, the pace and leading interventional radiology. And well, what did they teach us about leaders and being an interventional radiologist? They were incredibly creative. They came up with new dynamic things. They didn't wait for cases to come come to them. And, the, you know, the days and the eras of sitting in the room and waiting for somebody to request something is not how you develop a field. It's not how you expand the field. It's not how you compete in a field. And these two, way back when, weren't like that. They were aggressive, both of them. They were confident. They were aggressive. But you heard in the voice uh, uh, of daughter what kind of person he was. He doesn't sound like an, you know, a jerk or anything like that. And he certainly wasn't. Neither was Berheny. And you know, I can attest to both of them uh, being like that. They were clinicians. That's the most important thing. We talk in IR about being clinicians, but we're not clinicians. We don't really take care of patients as much as we think we are. And that is super important. That's how you get respect. That's how you get patients. And you've got to get away from just being a proceduralist. And they got out there and they showed what they can do. You saw that movie from Daughter. You saw that Berheny had spread all over the New York Times in a positive way. Amazing story for IR. Now, on the left here is, uh, this is a little bit of an old picture, is Fred Keller, one of the leaders of interventional radiology, uh, radiologists. He was chairman at the in, in Oregon, uh, in Portland at the university, and a well-known interventionalist. And that's me on the right again a few years ago. I'm a little older than that now. But Fred did something in the early 2000s and presented at the SIR meeting. And what he did is he went around his area in Oregon and he asked people, what is interventional radiology? Have you heard of interventional radiology? So recently, this summer, I did the same thing. And this is something I think it's important for you to hear, hear in training when people respond to my questions. Again, it's a video. I hope it's got a, you know, you'll appreciate it. I hope you think it's a little bit funny and uh, informative. But this is just this year about interventional radiology. And I asked, what is an interventional radiologist? What is a trauma surgeon? What is a cardiologist? Do people know that? So let's start with the video here. Do you know what that is? No. Do you have any idea what an interventional radiologist does? No. Procedures. Okay, what kind of procedures? Um, let's see. Um, things with cameras. Um, I'm not so sure, actually. Okay. Um, okay. Probably it's something to do with x-rays, uh. Okay. Um, not off the top. No, I, I, I'd love to learn more, but I don't know. Interventional radiologist? Yes. Um, I can't say that I have heard that term. Have you ever heard that term, or do you know what it means? You used to date a radiologist's daughter. You did? Okay. How about interventional radiologist? No. No, I don't. I know what radiology is. Okay. What's radiology? It's um, having um, x-rays. Okay. Sort of um, I don't know what it means, but I assume it would mean that you... Um, try to do preventative medicine or radiology prior to um, it being uh, an issue or a problem. I had to speculate it would be somebody who is trying to use radiology to like figure out how to care for someone before an incident becomes an issue. Preventative care as opposed to like... Sort of. Okay. Well, sort of. Oh, okay. I know it's, it's a, the division that does a lot of procedures. Okay. Procedures meaning um things apart from regular X rays, CTs, and MRIs. So going inside. And for full disclosure, you work for the chief of emergency radiology. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Would you have any idea what that means? No. Okay. You stopped going out with a radiologist, daughter? Yes. Yes. Did you intervene too much? <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, it's radiology that's done to prevent something or stop them from getting worse or intervening. Wow, pretty good. Have you, have you had a procedure done? Or how do you know about it? <laughs> yes, I've had many procedures done. Do you know what a trauma surgeon does? Absolutely. Okay, how about a cardiologist? Okay. 
Do you know what a trauma surgeon does? Yes. Do you know what a cardiologist does? Yes. Who's going to win the FedEx Cup? The uh, Healthy Books kept on. Okay. You got them all right. Thanks. Yeah, you get somebody that got a serious injury, though. The trauma surgeon takes care of it. How about a, a cardiologist? I've got to. Some of the work are. Okay. Have you ever seen uh, the word interventional radiologist anywhere in the newspaper or uh, on TV? No. Do you know what a trauma surgeon does? Yes. Uh, how about a cardiologist? Uh, uh, yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, that would be someone who's uh, suffering an immediate um, need for medical attention. How about a cardiologist? Yes, I'm going to see a cardiologist today. It's about your heart. Okay. Okay. Yeah. But nothing but interventional radiology. How about a trauma surgeon? No, nothing. You don't know what a trauma surgeon is? No. How about a cardiologist? Cardiologist, say no. Okay, all right. Actually, trauma, I know, because I have surgery for my teeth. Okay, all right. Actually, yeah, I don't know. But you've never met an interventional radiologist? No, I'm the no. first. Yeah, you've got Aren't you lucky? Thank you. Lucky too. <laughs> nice to meet you. Thank you. Same to you. So uh, I understand there were some audio uh, problems, and I apologize, but I think you get the gist here. Uh, I had a lot of fun doing it. That's literally less than 300 yards from the Mass General Hospital. Some were even patients there. The one person who seemed to know a little bit about procedures, when I talked to him more, I think he was talking about a vascular surgeon doing procedures on him. So, you know, clearly we need a radio show, or I'd love to do a podcast, but I don't think anybody would listen to it or we need uh, a television show. You know how radiologists and interventionists are portrayed on television shows. Uh, even that show Boston Med, where uh, actually IR on a trauma patient saved the patient's life with an embolization was completely you know, forgotten about. So that's, that's where we live, guys. Uh, people need to know a little bit about this. When you go see a patient, I always say I'm an interventional radiologist. And patients are confused by that because there's all these other interventional people and they see in the hospital millions of doctors. But you've got to always, you got to sell yourself. you got to get out there and tell people what you do. Um, you know, I'll, I'll tell you a story. I hope my wife isn't listening because I am at home. So I've been doing this, as you know, as I said, for since the late 70s. My wife's a pediatrician. She knows a little bit about medicine. And every night we walk our dog and it's about, 10 or 15 years ago, we were walking our dog on a cold winter night. We're talking about our day. And I told her, I said, you know, I did this little, I did a liver biopsy in this little three-year-old. And uh, it was an ultrasound guided biopsy. And I said, you know, so I was worried. The kid was so small. I was worried the needle was going to go right through the liver and into the mattress afterwards. And I was obviously joking, but she looked at me and she said, you do liver biopsies? So, you know, that's where we are, even in our own families. Uh, you know, I don't know your spouses, or your partners, or your parents know what interventional radiology is, but I suspect not. It's not well known, uh, except, you know, by the particular patients who you do your procedure on. So what's happened over the years? I just showed you uh, nice pictures of daughter. I hope you were able to hear a little bit. If not, you got the gist anyway of that spectacular video of him. Uh, uh, and you know, we we were on top of the world uh, when it first started. But what happened? It became uh, there's confusion out there. There's crossover, and there's definitely competition. There's interventional cardiology. There's interventional endovascular surgery. There's interventional gastroenterology. There's interventional nephrology. There's interventional pulmonology. Everybody uses that word, which explains some of the confusion in the video I showed you. And, and uh, the difficulty in you as an interventional is standing out. You've got to work at standing out. And there's a reason, by the way, that some people have taken our turf. You know, way back when Berani was there and Daughter was there, there weren't, there weren't any vascular surgeons doing endovascular. Uh, this is another thing sort of to wake you up. This is, uh, and I, we work really great with our trauma surgery, but you can see the slide, it's a little small, American Association of Surgery of Trauma, and a lecture by, I believe, I'm not sure, but I think the surgeon's from Michigan, and maybe a joke, death begins in radiology. You know, some trauma centers want their trauma surgeons to do embolization, to learn how to do iliac embolization. Not that hard, but 
that we'll get to that point. Why are they doing that? Because they don't know the interventionalists or the interventionalists aren't coming in, aren't available. You know, you never hear a trauma surgeon not coming in. This happens in radiology in some places. So I'm sorry, you know, this guy's from the Medical College of Wisconsin. But the point is, it's a it's a little bit of a battle out there. People don't know you. It's up to you to make this specialty a little better known. And, uh, you know, I spent a long time in it. I think I got a whole bevy of patients who appreciate what I do and know, know me. But, you know, it's not a well-known specialty, despite what we do. So, you know, what happened out there uh, in some of the turf that we lost? You know, which, you know, Berheny and, and, and Dada represent sort of the apex of the pyramids where they we were controlling everything. Look, some things just are frankly better. Uh, ERCP is a better procedure than percutaneous biliary drainage in some patients. It's, you know, I don't know if you've ever seen ERCPs, but you go up to the ERCP room and there's guide wires all over the floor. Sterility is not even a question. They never seem to get infections. I'm not saying they don't get complications occasionally, but they don't get infections that often. Uh, or, you know, they don't worry about it. Uh, and it's interesting, ERCP is very dependent. Uh, you know, at the Mass General, we had a guy who left now three or four years ago who was unbelievably aggressive and unbelievably good. I, I liked him. We worked together a lot. I'd go up to, and we'd do rendezvous procedures sometimes, and I would use his endoscope, which I think is pretty easy, actually, after a while. But, uh, you know, he probably thinks what I do is easy. He left. All of a sudden, guess what? Our biliary drainage case numbers have increased. Some things we lost because of politics, you know, what, what are vascular surgeons gonna do with all this endovascular techniques? And they're not gonna, they can't continue to operate. Everything's getting smaller, more laparoscopic, if you will, or more minimally invasive, I should say. Some places you're doing, some places do a lot of vascular uh, procedures. And I'm not talking about embo, I'm talking about um, uh, peripheral artery disease. Some people don't, it's not the end of the world if you don't, or if you do. But you have to understand the politics and some places, you know, you may go to where the competition is, is already done. You're not going to do that many. But, you know, there are other things we'll talk about. In a sense, some of the problems we've had in turf battles and why people don't know it is because we sort of lost our edge. I hate to say it, but we got a little complacent. We sat in our little rooms and we waited for people to come to us. We didn't go out. We didn't see patients. We didn't make rounds. We didn't have clinics. Some things aren't sexy and we don't really want to do them. And I just listed a couple of things, chest drainages, chest stuff, abscess drainages. If you go to the meetings and go, just an abscess drainage, not sexy, dialysis. Yeah, there are experts who talk about it. There are new things in dialysis, but it's not the sexiest thing. Veins is all over the place. People, vascular surgeons do it. Vascular medicine people do it. Uh, podiatrists do it, for God's sake. And some people just don't want to do it. It's kind of not sexy. But... You know, I, I think that's something we got to change out there. We got to realize that just because you're a quote interventional radiologist doesn't mean the only thing you should do is percutaneous tumor ablation or treatment of cryotherapy for metastatic bone pain to the ribs or <coughs> certs or taces. Uh, you know, uh, there's many things that make you a good doctor. And I think in some cases we've lost that thought. Referral service, you know, we've, you've got to get out there and you've got to get these cases. Uh, we, we lost cases. Uh, you know, I had an old chairman who said, uh, service, be, do service, but not servitude. And that's a subtle but important difference. And what he meant by that is, you know, we are service oriented and you've got to be prepared to do that. It doesn't mean you have to be the slave or uh, of somebody in, that you can't get respect. One of the ways you res get respect is you become more clinical. You actually see patients. You don't take care of patients. I can't believe how many people do procedures and never see the patient afterwards. It, it shocks me around the country, to be honest. And that's not the way, and that's changing, I hope. But see, you know, being clinical is not just having your little outpatient clinic with your three-piece suit and tapping on somebody's knee and talking about a cert. There's money more, get your hands dirty, <clears throat> what I call blue collar type things that make you a doctor. And of course, the other thing is, <clears throat> excuse me, and I've reiterated that we're not necessarily doctors to the public. I mean, have you seen too many, any movies about interventional radiologists? Not many. But cardiologists and trauma, everybody knows them. 
So I look at interventional radiology as sort of a created demand. I mean, it's a little bit like diamond rings in my book. Um, you know, di I love diamond rings. They're pretty and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, they're just sort of pretty rocks. And what Madison Avenue and advertisers have done have made this a created demand and expensive. And interventional radiology is a little bit like that. <clears throat> People can live without you doing these procedures. They can operate. They can do it themselves. You've got to make sure that they are dependent on you. And that's part of your job in the future. Um, and it's important. But I don't want you to panic. There are plenty of niches. The future is good. And it depends a little bit on you guys out there uh, pushing it and becoming the clinicians and the docs. Because if anybody can do, I mean, I have a guy who, put together something in my house, incredibly meticulous uh, craftsmanship, working on a back door, sliding door. Uh, and, you know, he I think he can do interventional procedures, but it's more than that. It's more than just the proceduralist. It's, you got to be the doctor. You got to be compassionate. You got to take care of patients. It's more than just doing this stuff. And, uh, you know, as the song says, and you can't always get what you want. You can't always get what you want. You can't. it in again can you hear me now can you hear me now guys i don't know what you heard in the past okay so <clears throat> i was going to say that you you know you can't always get what you what you want you you were you may not do as many biliary cases as people did many years ago you may not be doing peripheral vascular disease it doesn't mean you're not a good interventional radiologist Go to start multidisciplinary clinics, and we'll have some examples at the end of this talk about people who did. It's more, it's more than just oncology patients. Everybody thinks that's the sexy thing. You go to the SIR, everybody wants to do that. There's a lot of stuff out there. I go to trauma conference, I go to their M and M conference. I love going to their M and M conference because I learned they have problems just like we do with communication. And you know, we have a lot of trauma cases that we see, whether they're post-trauma abscesses, chest tubes, uh, embos, you name it. Become a clinical doctor. I can't emphasize that enough. They'll res you got to get respect. You can't just be a proceduralist uh, and expect, expect that. What else is good that we're doing? And we're doing some of these. I think we need to do more. The DRIR residency, which some of you are going to participate in, and many of you are already participating in, is a spectacular change. It gives you longitudinal <clears throat> time at a hospital. You learn a lot of places. You go to the ICU uh, or you have a, a, a subspecialty rotation, I hope. And you learn things. You get to know people. And it's a spectacular change. I don't know how we ever did it with a one-year or zero fellowships. There are many new procedures out there. IR is always an evolving and changing field. 
and you shouldn't forget it. If you, you know, just because you lost in your hospital PAD doesn't mean you can't introduce something else. And I'll I'll give you examples of that of individuals out there who who do that. In the last 10 years, these are the kind of things that have that have occurred. And there some are what I call blue collar cases, mean there's sweat and dirty cases and you got a lot of stuff to do. Some are what you call white collar cases, like <clears throat> you see your tumor patient in an outpatient clinic and then you go take care of them. Uh, and uh, then you put your suit back on and you know they don't have any catheters sticking out of them and they're clean and you just have to check their band-aids. Uh, Look at the cases that have happened in the last 10 years. I can point out with my pointer here. Certs and cases way up. You know, it wasn't too long ago that embos in our hospital, we were doing just plain embos. Uh, and, you know, the pain issue was so bad that some of our referring physicians said, too uncomfortable. We're not going to, we're not going to give you uh, any cases. I don't know where my pointer is, guys, so I'm sorry I've lost that uh, too in this thing. <clears throat> Ablation, sac sacroplasty, cementoplasty for pain, very popular in Europe, very, very new procedure. Prostate embo, um, AV fissure uh, uh, creation and dialysis patients, something people, look, dialysis patients are hard, you know, but boy, can that be satisfying helping somebody live longer and doing all these things. Fibroid embo, all in the last 10 years. <clears throat> Transplenic tips. Tips is another one of these sexy cases, but there are new things we're doing with that. Pain treatment, cryoablation or radiofrequency ablation, incredible changes. A nice, that's one of the most satisfying procedures you can do. Complex non-vascular cases. Here's an abscess case with 50 drains in the patient. And yes, this patient lived. A great guy, by the way. He was a drug dealer with multiple liver abscesses. I got to know him pretty well because I saw him every day. He offered me some drugs, which I didn't take, but he ended up doing all right. So these are the kind of new procedures I've listed on the on the right just in the last 10 years. And there, there's new stuff out there. So, I, I, you know, even though I've said that nobody knows interventional radiology and there's competition, we seem to overcome it, you know, with our ingenuity or with our abilities. And so I think the future is pretty bright. But <clears throat> you're going to see a lot of Bill Belichick quotes. And uh, until this year, everybody loved him, at least everybody in Boston. But it's an important quote. It's not the X's and O's. It's not the machinery you use. It's not the catheters you use. It's the Jims and Joes. It's the people. It's you people out there who are going to make a difference in this specialty. And I'm going to give you an example. So John Lippman. I, he looks pretty young in this picture, actually. Uh, I think he's about 60. He was a resident uh, when I was a young staff person at the Brigham Hospital in Boston. Good athlete, a little bit of a head case, but a good athlete, played softball. And we had a, uh, a bi-institutional softball team that was a pretty good team. And he ended up uh, going down to Atlanta, Georgia, and setting up his own private sort of women's imaging care office mainly taking care of patients with fibroids talk about an incredibly small specialty and he's a he's a i think uh expanded a little bit he's not you know some people know him he talks at the sir but the thing about going back to what i said about not sitting on your haunches actually going out and getting patients when i called john to sort of interview him for this talk a couple of months ago or many months ago now i guess in the, in the late summer he was actually at a fair in Atlanta, a health fair, and he was setting up his own sort of booth and talking to people, talking to people about what he could do as an interventionist to help with like particularly fibroids, but other venous things. And, you know, he's got a clinic in Atlanta. There's his part of his clinic. It's, he, I think he finally has a partner, doesn't have a lot of rooms, but he gave me, you know, what his keys were and, and they pretty much fit into what I think is important. He's a clinician. I don't even like that word. He's a doctor. He's, you know, he's not working for a hospital. Uh, he thought that hospitals promote their brand. Uh, again, I'm losing this pointer. Darn it. Uh, and not the MD. He called himself an IRpreneur, which is an interesting thought process. 
So he took care of these people from stop, start to stop. <clears throat> he's on TV about this. So he's gone out and taken a small little area. Now, for some people, that's this is pretty much all he does. For some people, that's just a small part of what they do. But he's an example of somebody who is a, you know, it's not the X's and O's, it's the Jim's and Joe's. He, he basically lives this philosophy of going out, creating demand, creating a, an experience for a patient so they know who he is. And he talks about subspecialization and complete control over his process. Those are the lines in blue, and I can't point to them. I apologize. Uh, and he's trying to change that uh, that uh, uh, appreciation or the uh, the acknowledgement of what an IR person uh, really is. And so they get to know you as a real doc. This is somewhat of an old slide, but it points out a little bit about the good parts of IR and the parts that people don't know about. So Phil Nicholson, as you know, is a great golfer. His wife, uh, and one of their last child uh, children after birth had, had bleeding. And if you look at this paragraph, Mickelson added that had the radiologist specialist not been driving to see a friend and been two minutes away to have emergency procedure, his wife might have died. So clearly she had an embo. Uh, but notice the word interventional radiology is not in there at all. Uh, now, this is a little bit of an older slide, but it sort of points to the problem we have. Interventional radiology is especially that you've got to promote yourself. Always talk about what you are. Otherwise, because you are a radiologist, but you're a little more than that, too. And it's important, I think, for people you're taking care of to know what you do. And it's it's hard out there because most people, patients don't, as I said. Now, you've heard a little bit about how hard interventional radiology is, how there's an article. This is an article from JVIR this year about burnout. Um, and uh, I won't go into all the details, but it's, a, it's an issue for people who do interventional radiology. And if you do it, <clears throat> you know, let's face it, it's different from imaging. In imaging, you know, if you read the, you know, it's not a tremendous urgency to read a musculoskeletal MR. But there's constant pressure in IR. The people who wrote this article said that one of the things that came up is was no fun, uh, which I find, you know, I've never had, well, I won't say I've always had fun, but that's the reason I like to work there still, because I do have fun. And I'll show you why in a sec. It's RVU based. Everybody cares about how many films you read or something like that. And it's hard in some cases to get high RVUs with interventional procedures, depending on whether you're an inpatient or outpatient or what you're doing. There are always emergencies, which, you know, is true. If it's just two of you, you, you can have emergencies. There's no respect. That's something you've got to create. There's no patient feedback. I don't understand the no patient feedback. I mean, if you're a proceduralist and you just do procedures and you, you want to just install doors, that's then you're not going to get feedback. If you're actually taking care of a patient, you'll have fun. You'll be getting feedback. You know, I, I get a lot of positive feedback. And, and I, I have cases today that came in and did, you know, people wouldn't even think about as being fun. I have a patient who's got a tumor uh, that will not heal and it's infected. And I, I see her every five weeks to change her catheter. And I know her a little bit about her family. We talk a little bit. And you know, is it a hard procedure? No. But does it keep her out of the hospital and keep her alive so she doesn't get septic? Yes. And is that satisfying? She's very grateful that we do this and I see her. I enjoy that. I mean, it's not what you would call sexy, but it gives me the happiness that makes me, you know, want to do these procedures. Taking care of patients, I think, is fun. Uh, you know, it, it's taking care of patients is more than clinics. It's more than uh, you know, it, it's knowing your patients uh, is is really, I think, the beauty of what we do. I'm going to show you this video, which I hope you can hear. Oh shoot! There we go. Okay, now you can go. Yeah. You look like Doctor Hurdle on that one. Yeah, don't now don't fall on me though. I'll explain what the story is afterward. Whoa! What a shot! 
So that was a lady who had a, uh, see if I can get her picture back again. And she's allowed me to show this. Um, she had a chronic biliary problem from malignant recurrence. And I was working with her with a transplant doctor. Um, she had a catheter in place so we could not take out. And uh, she wanted to play golf. That was her main thing. And so I proved to her that she could hit a golf ball. You can see she had a pretty good job. And uh, I made a comment that she hit it better than uh, the surgeon who was taking care of her, this doctor who I actually do play golf with. And the truth is she probably is better. And, uh, you know, she's a delightful lady. Uh, she, uh, she died. Uh, but, you know, the fact just showing her, and I've done this for several patients, uh, you know, allowing, telling them they can ride a horse if they got a catheter in, this kind of stuff, just making their life a little bit more livable, which I think is part of our job, has made it fun. And, you know, I think we enjoyed our little interaction there. So philosophy to live for as an interventionalist, you got to have that passion, you got to have that fire that you're you're, you know, you're, you're doing something for somebody, even if it's little, even if it's a pick line or the sighty staff. I mean, I've had plenty of people been very thankful that we've been able to do those things. You got to buy the mission, buy the importance of what you're doing. And for God's sake, pee on your territory. And that means protect what you're doing. And the way you do that is you got to be, you got to be doing the case and going out and after the case, and you got to prove you can do the case. Now that gets us to the question, why patients get referrals, all docs, not just IR docs. And you've heard this before, the four A's, and, but I'm gonna talk a little bit about it. affable. You know, if you walk around and you sulk in your office and you complain and bitch every time somebody asks you something, you're not gonna get cases. Somebody less competent will. You gotta be available. And you know, that's one of the, I think it's okay to be available. I mean, that's part of your business if you're gonna go into IR. You gotta be accessible. You got to not only be available, you got to like, if you have a trauma coming in, you can't spend two hours trying to get in, you know, otherwise the trauma surgeons are going to learn to do your procedure. Uh, and I think eventually IR will be 24 seven coverage in some hospitals. Affordable is in there. I don't know if, you know, affordable, maybe in the future. I don't think people think that much about, uh, about how much things cost. I put ability in there under in yellow ability. You know, I hate to say it. I'm not sure ability is as important as being the as being ex available and affable. Uh, it's sometimes hard to prove that you're better at doing a, a, an embo than a vascular surgeon. I mean, it's hard. And if he's more or she's more affable, if they're together in the OR with the doc who's referring it, they may get the cases. But hopefully, your ability will show show out. And you know, in in some sense, I mean, they're I hope, but I'm not sure that's the most important, but you certainly want to work to try to get that. I mean, I have this theory about ability anyway. There, there are a few savants in IR in every group. I mean, in my group, I'm not a savant. I'm a, like a ditch digger, but in a lot of groups, and I refer some of the tough cases to what I think of the savants who are just technically uh, up, above other people. Dependability is more important than ability. Another Bill Belichick quote. And you know that's pretty self obvious. If you're if you're not dependable, if they call you, you're not available. You can't do a case. Guess what? Somebody with less ability is going to do it. So you got to get out there and prove that. This I want to show you too. I mean, again, I've given you some of the positives and what you got you got to work for. My daughter, uh, I'm in Boston. My daughter is, does research, clinical research, and is a is a hospital, it's in a major, major, not my hospital, major uh, hospital in Boston. She's on the floor taking care of patients. This is what she sent me. I hate interventional radiology. And you know what the reason was? She had a patient upstairs with a catheter in place with, from pancreatitis. And she's smart, I think. She's a hospitalist, but she can't expect her to know how to take care of those patients. She couldn't get the interventional team to come up and see the patient. They had never seen the interventional team on the floor. If you want to practice like that, then I don't think you belong in interventional radiology. I think that's why that's the problem. That's why she wrote that. She meant it. And, you know, it gives us all a bad name. You've got to take care of what you do. I mean, it's so crazy. I mean, again, I've said this a couple of times. How can you do a procedure and not follow a patient? I, I just don't get that. 
So what about referring physicians? I don't like the word clinicians because radiologists use that all the time. If you're training in radiology or something, you say, talk to the clinicians. You're a clinician, God's sake. You've got to be, you got to be, you got to consider yourself the clinician. And they need to be, you know, I say treated like family. Sometimes I say treated like dogs when there's my dogs on the, on, on the screen, but they got to be trained. Physicians, the referring physicians have got to be trained. You've got to be clinical to train them. What, what are your limits? You know, you do a procedure and they're, you know, they're a little worried because they're not used to what you're doing. For example, I don't know, how about uh, draining an abscess in the left upper quadrant where you have to go through the pleural space? And then, you know, some people go nuts. I'm going through the pleural space. I'm going to contaminate it. Well, that's not true. And then you got to know how to take care of that. You know, if it's a pleural fusion and you're going through it, you can put a chest tube in. You have to sort of set limits for them and set their expectations. And you got to cultivate them like gardens. Uh, and, you know, I'd say water them. Get to know them. I mean, I try to make an effort of knowing everybody we deal with, talking to them about family, talking about outside stuff. You know, you know they're stressed, too, at any hospital, anybody's stressed, whether it's a 200-bed hospital or a 1,200-bed hospital like I work in. Everybody's always stressed. I mean you know, you're not more stressed than anybody else who's like, you know, even the person cleaning the floor is stressed because there's pressure on them to turn over the room. So, you know, you got to get to know these people. Don't, don't act like you're above them all. So let me give you another example. We're almost here wrapping up this talk. I hope, I hope uh, you haven't fallen asleep yet, or maybe you aren't even listening. So a couple of examples, I already told you about John Lippman again, and these are people I've met along the course of the SIR, or just gone to their talks. George Behrens is an interventional radiologist in, in practice outside of Chicago. And he went to the, he made this effort, this huge effort of setting up a portal hypertension clinic where patients are referred to, to his area outside of the main Chicago hospitals where there are thousands, you know, there's University of Chicago, there's Northwestern, there's a million hospitals in there. They have almost too many hospitals for their patients. There are not enough room for the patients. So what George did with his colleagues is set up a clinic outside where patients actually got referred to his clinic where he had multidisciplinary specialties. Uh, and it took a while to set up. So instead of, as in this slide, showing on your left, radiologic right, but your left, community hospitals referring to the tertiary center, he turned it around and had the tertiary center referring to the community hospitals. That's sort of brilliant idea. He had to work like crazy to get this to work. So now patients who are in these tertiary hospitals where they just don't have enough space or time or whatever, they get into this perfectly set up clinic in a community hospital. And, you know, it takes a lot of work, takes a lot of effort, takes a lot of coordination. But again, he's created a man and has a, uh, if you, I don't know if he's at the SIR this year, but if he goes, if he's given a course, you should go to it. It's spectacular. And you'll learn a little bit more how he set that up all by hard work. And finally, I went to this, this guy's course uh, several years ago uh, about, uh, at the SIR, Mark Dean. And he grew his own practice. He started out uh, by himself. He uh, started taking care of podiatry problems, you know, and uh, and some, uh, you know, working out with them and uh, cultivating them. Sometimes the patients had bone tumors that needed to be aspirated or biopsied that he'd eventually treat with ablation if, if you know, if that was the right treatment, obviously. Uh, he got to know them, and they started re uh, referring to him uh, peripheral vascular disease. And he basically built a practice out of being available and affable and skillful and uh, evol evolving his practice to the specialized sort of orthopedic thing. And, you know, he said, basically, he created this minimally invasive uh, practice of his, which is not attached to a major hospital. And uh, his area happens to be a lot of musculoskeletal skeletal stuff, but uh, this is part of what his advertising is, and he does all these things. He's created a pretty big practice. Another interesting uh, workshop, if you still if you go to it. And his point is: grow a niche, grow an idea, get out there, and 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 practice 
clinical medicine and, and they will come to you. You know, that old line from the movie, build it and they will come. He, again, gives talks at local community centers. And I mean, I don't do that. I don't, because I, I live in a, in a, I work in a teaching hospital. I still go out and go to conferences in the hospital and I still talk to people on the floor and I make an effort to talk to everybody about every patient I see. I mean, my cell phone battery is always dead, but I think it helps. They know who interventional radiology is. And this is guys saying the same thing. So in summary, what is IR? You are who you want to be. And the future out there, even though there's competition, if you apply, I think what you're learning at the SIR and going to these meetings and hopefully I'm going to talk like this, you are who you want to be. And you don't have to worry about that, but you have to work at it. It's like everything else. It's not going to come to you. And I leave you with this quote from Dune, which is a great, um, I think, science fiction book uh, from many years ago. I must not fear. Fear is the mind killer. Fear is the little death that brings total obliteration. I will face my fear. I will permit it to pass over me and through me. And when it has gone past, I will turn the inner eye to see its path. Where the fear has gone, there will be nothing. Only I will remain. And hopefully this talk has given you uh, a little bit of incentive uh, and help, I hope. It hasn't been too uh, dreary for you. Uh, IR is out there for the taking, as are all these other procedures. And there are many, many, many procedures for you to learn and do. Become a doctor, become a clinical doctor, take care of your patients, and the rest will fall in place. Uh, thank you for listening, uh, and uh, take care. Happy New Year, and thanks again.